Good morning, everyone. How's the volume? Can everyone in back hear me? Great. Well, welcome to What Panels Can Teach Us About Web Components. My name is Steve Persh. I'm a senior engineer and team lead with Palantir.net. Today we're going to be talking about panels and web components. Uh, to do that, I think we should start by defining these terms. So what are web components? The Wikipedia definition we've got here, a W3C specification that allows for the creation of reusable widgets or components in a web document and web application. Uh, I like to think of web components as the next step in the history of HTML. So if we look at an extremely abbreviated history of HTML, split up into before HTML5, HTML5, and after HTML5. We can see that before HTML5, we had these old reliable elements like the select element. And in the select element, you could use elements like option groups, options. And with that, we got the first era of the web. We got basic functionality, basic forms. I'm sure many of you have tried to style one of these. And they can be incredibly difficult to style. Uh, but they're also incredibly reliable. With just a little bit of markup, you don't have to define exactly how this works. You just say, I want to be able to select something. I want groups of options. And with a little bit of markup, you get incredibly robust behavior. That's kind of difficult to customize. In the next step in HTML history, in our extremely abbreviated history, we have HTML5. It took a couple of years, just about a decade, to get HTML5 uh, to where it is now. But now with HTML5, we get things like the audio tag, the video tag, a new set of semantic tags that uh, bring us more robust functionality. Um, who here spent way too many hours trying to get MP3 is playing on the web before the audio element? Uh, and now with just a little, little bit of markup, Come on. Oh, we, we can get the, the sound of inception, um, which is too low to hear. But <laughs> there it is. Uh, so with HTML5, we get new semantic elements. We get uh, a greater ability to customize. These elements are a whole lot easier to customize than uh, those old elements like select lists, uh, other form elements. In the next step, in HTML's history, after HTML5, we get web components. And they allow us to do, us to do things like this, define a tag specifically for GIFs. Now, why do we need a tag specifically for GIFs? So that we can declare GIF behavior. Here's a GIF element. It's a web component uh, available for anyone in the world to download. And once you download this web component and add it to your site, then anywhere on the site you can say, I want a GIF, and I want the ping pong behavior that uh, replays the GIF backwards when it gets to the end. So similar to those, those attributes that you have with old school elements like the select list and options where all you need to do is use one word and say, this is the selected element, this is the selected option in my select list. With web components, you can do things like not worry about how this GIF playback system works. I don't really know how it works myself other than I've included this web component and I've said ping pong it please. Uh, I could also have options for syncing it up with audio and make it play slower or faster. So the benefit we're, that we're getting here with web components is the ability to cleanly separate the definition of new elements from their usage. I don't need to know that much about how this GIF element works to be able to use it. I just need to say the code that defines it is over there, and I'm going to use it right here in one line of code. This is something that uh, I think is revolutionizing the web. We've, we've had this concept for a while, being able to use packages and components of front-end code, uh, like everyone's favorite jQuery cycle, but that's not quite as clean as this. It's not quite as standardized as this. It's not... Um, it's not as clean to be able to say, just the GIF element, please. Um, 
So this is a, a relatively simple example where the only piece of data that you're passing in is a URL to a GIF. Uh, but of course it can get more complicated. Here's a, a proof of concept from um, the Drupal Web Components module. Of course there's a Drupal Web Components module. Uh, it hasn't had much attention lately, but it allows for Drupal to do things like this. This is just the, the GitHub IO demo of this web component. You define front and back elements for this flipping card, how you want it to flip, and with just a tiny bit of markup, you can get this behavior with a web component. Encapsulated front end behavior. And I, I think I've now lost my slides. There we go. Uh, so in Drupal, all you need to do is say, I want the flip card element. It's going to flip on this axis. This is the front of the card. This is the back of the card. And that's it. Oh, well, I've gone too far ahead. We're going to ask why we care about panels, but for, or why we care about web components. But first, what is panels? Panels is a user interface for the theme function. The theme function has been there in Drupal for a long time, uh, but it can be difficult to use. And when a lot of people think of panels, they first jump to that incredibly complex user interface. So if this is a user interface on top of theme, well, of course, people are going to think of the user interface first. But let's, let's put aside the user interface just for a second and think about what is panels really doing under the hood? What does it need to do? What does it need to abstract to make itself a user interface on top of hook theme? Well, it needs to be able to be aware of data, data like nodes, user objects, taxonomy terms. It needs to be aware of data uh, like this node object, and it needs to be able to get that object ready for printing in a template. Panels uh, organizes its, its templates in layout plugins. So this is a, a sample layout plugin from panels module, and really all that's happening in here is the printing of a left column and a right column. Panels can send in a node object and somehow transform it into something that is ready to print in left and right. And by the time uh, these variables get to the template file, they're already stringified, they're already uh, all set to be printed in simply left and right. Now how does, how does panels do that? In core, it takes a lot of messy pre-processing to get a node object ready to be printed in a template file. Well, Panels does it with a lot of user-defined configuration. That This is the part that comes from that uh, complex user interface. A big dump of PHP uh, configuration. This is where Panels gets its instructions to take a node object and get it ready to be printed in simply left and right or whatever your layout plugin is. So here's some radically oversimplified Panels code to, to show what the basic idea of Panels is. If we can imagine a method that doesn't actually exist, but we can imagine there's a method called render a panel. The only thing that method would need is the incoming data, be it a node object, two node objects, some taxonomy terms. So it takes in its raw data. It takes in the name of the panel's configuration that it's going to use. That could be the name of a mini panel. Uh, a mini panel is just going to be that big export object, like a views object is a big exported list of um, PHP configuration. So it just needs the data. It needs the name of that thing. It's then going to ask that configuration, what's the name of the theme hook that I need? What's the name of the layout plugin? What's the name of that template file that we're going to end up in? Because all we're trying to do here is take raw data and get it ready to be printed in that relatively simple template. So what's the name? Oh, and what are those instructions for getting this node ready to be printed in that thing? After that, all it needs to do is a really, really simple invocation of the theme function. A lot of the times in the theme function, as it's used in core, what happens after you call theme is really, really complicated. It's going to go through literally 10 layers of pre-processing, 10 layers of processing, all to get those variables ready. Here, just about any developer in this room, literally any developer in this room could rewrite what needs to happen after this, because all that's happening 
is taking things that are already strings and putting them in a template file. Panels, abstracts, all that, all the other complexity into one spot. And panels can operate on multiple levels. It can operate on the panels everywhere level, which basically takes over what you would otherwise do in page.tpl. It can work at the page manager level, which takes over what you would otherwise do in hook menu. It can work at the panelizer level, uh, taking over view modes instead of using core's view mode user interface. Uh, and it can take over the block level, which is, uh, which is many panels. So why should we care about web components? They're, they're a new thing that you might have seen on a session title, just like um, we've heard about Angular is going to revolutionize front-end web development. We've heard React is going to, and Ember, and Backbone, and Marionette, and Riot.js, and Knockout.js, and whatever JavaScript MVC was started at the beginning of this session and will be released at the end. Uh, you know, I'm talking about web components in this presentation, but I think a lot of these concepts apply to these other modern front-end tools. They're all offering a new way of encapsulating our front-end work. And the ability to componentize and reuse is a measure of progress. And we've seen a ton of progress in the PHP community and Drupal on the server side. To quote our own Larry Krell Garfield from a talk called PHP Renaissance, the way to be more productive is to write less code. The way to be more productive is to reuse more code. The way to be more productive is to share more code. And on the PHP side, there are a bunch of factors that have contributed to our ability to do all three of these things. Larry defines the PHP renaissance as coming from uh, a couple causes. Class autoloading, which is something we've had in, in PHP for a while now. It was really hard, and then it, then it got easier. And class auto-loading made it much easier to, to share our work. GitHub gave us a common place to share that work. Namespaces made collisions less likely to happen. The PHP standards group got people talking to e each other. Composer makes it easy to pull these things in. And common interfaces tell us how to use these pieces together. Multiple causes leading to a PHP renaissance where now we can open up Drupal core, look at that vendor directory, and see that we've been able to replace big chunks of Drupal. We've been able to take that infamous Drupal HTTP request function and replace it with Guzzle, something much more robust, something much more uh, stable, and something that we didn't have to write, which is great because the ability to be more productive is to reuse more code, reuse code that you didn't even have to write. We can do that with the Symfony HTTP kernel. We can do that uh, with Twig. That was a huge help, not having to write and maintain our own templating layer makes us far more productive on the server side. And we're doing well on, on the front end, too. We've, we've had jQuery for years. And in Drupal 8, we're introducing uh, uh, even more front end JavaScript libraries that are making our lives a lot easier. Uh, but we can go further. We're playing out the ship of Theseus paradox in real life, the question of if you take a ship and replace its sails, do you still have the same ship? If you replace all of the deck of the ship, is it still the same ship? If you replace the hull, is it still the same ship? Well, I think I can say Drupal is still Drupal, even though we've gotten rid of our, way, our own way of making HTTP requests and replaced it with Guzzle. I think we're still Drupal, even though we've gotten rid of that part. I think we're still Drupal, even though we've gotten rid of TPLs. We've got... Uh, the fork of backdrop that, that has said, this is too far. This is no longer the same Drupal. And I'm simply glad that they're answering that question explicitly. I don't think there's a right or wrong answer here. Now the question before us is, do we have to write our own markup to be Drupal? Can we use web components that we didn't write and still be Drupal? In our markup, can we write less? We can. And Twig is, is helping us write even less. That extends concept means that each different block in core doesn't have to rewrite everything. We can write less because of Twig. Uh, we can reuse more. Twig helps with that as well. Uh, and stay uh, after lunch for John's core conversation where he'll be talking about another potential model of reuse in core. But can we share more? We've written an amazing responsive toolbar in Drupal 8. 
I think it's great. Other frameworks have similar things. There's a web component that does something like it. I think ours is a lot better. Can we share it with the outside world? Right now, not very easily. Right now, there's a strong coupling between the server-side logic that prepares the variables for that administrative toolbar and the actual front-end rendering of that toolbar. I think it'd be great if we could share it. I think it'd be great if, conceivably, someone wrote a better toolbar outside of Drupal that we could throw ours away and replace it with something even better and not have to rewrite everything to do that. So we've gotten this benefit on the server side, largely through the dependency injection container. Again, quoting Larry, a dependency injection container is simply an easier place to wire up what objects get passed to what other objects. This is something we need on the front end now, the ability to wire up two objects so that they don't have to know everything about one another, that the internals of core can simply say, I depend on this interface, that's all I need to know. I don't need to know every single detail about how it actually works. Just, just give me something compatible with the, the kernel interface that I know will work. I think we need to be able to figure out how to do that with, with the front end world. Uh, and we have a model in Panels. Panels provides analogous wiring between markup uh, for, for the source data going to our, our template files. The node object doesn't need to know what panel's template file is going to end up in. That panel's template file that simply knows left and right doesn't even need to know that a node is coming in. It could be a user. It could be taxonomy terms. It could be any number of things. It says, all I know is left and right. That's all I can do. To use web components properly, we're going to need to be able to bridge data and display in a way that doesn't completely couple them to each other. So individual lessons from panels that are, that are going to help us as we get ready for web components. Uh, in Drupal, we have a tendency to treat all of our theme hooks equally. Quoting from uh, the Drupal 7 module development book, one of the great things uh, about Drupal theming is, it, is the power of its granularity, the idea that each piece gets themed individually, and is passed along. Uh, I think this is, is best understood through a, a diagram. The, with the power of Drupal's theming system comes a whole lot of responsibility. Uh, that, that same book explains the theme system like this. Blocks render into a region, which render into a, uh, a page TPL. A node is composed of fields and a comment wrapper, and even below that, you have comments. And this is a simplified version. On a real Drupal site, you're going to have dozens and dozens of theme functions called on every single page. And it's hard to know which one do you care about. Do you care about the theme function that's rendering views row? Or do you care about the thing that's right inside of the views row? Which one are you theming? Uh, with panels, you get some level of prioritization. Splitting up a wireframe into panels pieces, you can say, this box is going to be the view mode, that's going to be taken over by Panelizer, and I'm going to think about what happens inside of there later. If you're working in that core model where each individual slice is equally important, it's hard to know when you can stop. Uh, it's hard to know when you can end the conversation. Um, it's handy to be able to say, this is happening in the view mode, that's all I need to know, that maps to Panelizer, we'll figure the rest out later. A good architecture allows you to defer critical decisions. This is not something we can attribute to panels, but Uncle Bob Martin. Uh, but it applies here. The ability to defer decisions later, to, to say, uh, we're going to have to figure out how to render that field sometime, but we know it's at least rendering inside of this view mode. So for now, it's enough to know it's going to happen inside of this layout plugin. Separation of names indicates separation of concerns. Again, looking at that traditional core model, each of those layers is both a Drupal uh, entity or uh, data structure, and it's the name of the template. So what's the name of the template used by article node teasers? Node article teaser. We've coupled completely the name of our template files to our internal data structures. This isn't 
necessarily bad, but it tells us that we haven't, we haven't truly separated our design from our data if they are named the same thing. Panels gives you the option to say that the article teaser is going to be rendered as an illustrated list item because that's how our design system <coughs> names this thing. And illustrated list item is also used for the interview content type tiny teaser view mode. Great. We can still have that illustrated list item uh, template file, use it with a bunch of different node types, use it with a bunch of different view modes as needed, and not have to uh, look at a directory with dozens and dozens of obtusely named template files, each containing near identical markup. Simple mental models help. I think Panels does have a simple mental model. We know it doesn't have a simple user interface, but the simple mental model helps me immensely, knowing that at each level, all I need to ask is what data is coming in and what layout plugin is the destination. Figuring out what happens in between can be difficult, but I know I'm starting at a clear place and I'm ending at a clear place. The front end world has its own mental models. Uh, a lot of the front end world calls itself MVC, Model View Controller, and you can draw a relatively simple diagram of what that looks like. Some of the modern front end world explicitly calls itself model view presenter, like Riot.js that says we have our, our model, be it our, our node object or other data domain object. We've got our view, which is little more than the printing of some variables, and we have a presenter that can pass in between. This to me sounds a lot like panels. And uh, depending on who you ask, Backbone is, is closest to this. Um, you can also use Backbone in more of an MVC fashion. Uh, it gets confusing in that the people who say Backbone is MVP say that the Backbone view concept is actually the presenter part of MVC. So uh, simple mental models can be quickly confused by confusing names. We know that in Drupal <laughs> to be true. Uh, there's also the concept of view model, view model, or model view, <laughs> view model, uh, which is used explicitly by Knockout.js. And this was a concept that came up uh, in a Twig presentation on Tuesday. The idea that we're still passing our full node object or user object into our template files, which have all of their methods available, everything you could ever want to know about them. Should we be passing a, a dumbed down version instead? Uh, a view model, uh, a version of the user object or the node object that is simplified for display rather than um, something that contains all of its implementation details. Wikipedia says that Drupal is presentation abstraction control. Uh, I did not know this until I went looking. Uh, now, now that I know, I, maybe I would do some Drupal site building differently. Uh, but we don't, we don't tend to talk about this very often. We think of the Drupal mental model as, as this. Or, or now in Drupal 8, our render pipeline looks more like this. I don't expect anyone to be, to be reading this diagram just to know that our diagrams are, are still relatively complicated. Uh, the, the simplified version is the, the Symphony HTTP kernel, so that... That scary diagram we just saw was a, a more fleshed out version of, of what we have in the Symphony HTTP kernel. But in Wim's presentation about the Drupal 8 render pipeline um, on Tuesday, he was saying, we've got a lot of ways to, to get your hands dirty in this pipeline. We've got events, uh, we still have some hooks, and we don't know which ones people are going to use most. Within, within this pipeline, you can hook in, in lots of places, and I think we're still going to have the problem of different groups of people using the same set of tools, but, com but with completely different models in their head about what they're doing. I can use panels and think, I'm doing something like model view presenter, but that doesn't guarantee that my coworker is going to be thinking in the same terms. That doesn't guarantee that the client's developers will be thinking in the same terms. The time it takes to for browsers to process web components is nothing compared 
to the time it takes our brains to understand them. If we can't understand the way we're doing rendering, the way we're using web components, the way we're using template files, how fast they are on the server or how fast they are in the browser is near irrelevant. Because if we can't use them, it doesn't matter how performant they are, we're not going to be able to use them. Oh, my inception image file is missing. Nesting is still the hard part of, of working with, with these tools. Uh, it wasn't until I saw the movie Inception that I really felt comfortable working with panels inside of panels. I've been work I'm serious, this is not a joke. I've been working with panels uh, in 2009, 2010, and felt like I kind of knew what I was doing. I was getting comfortable passing data in, and then I thought, but it seems like I need to be able to go a level deeper and do a mini panel inside of uh, a page manager layout. Is that even possible? Well, it is, but it's, it's the confusing part. Um, simple mental models help, but if our UI is so confusing, um, it's not going to matter. If we can't understand web components, um, it, it doesn't matter how performant they are. The next lesson, define dependencies and properties. So when you define a layout plugin and panels, you say, what CSS file does this layout plugin need in order to work? What is its theme hook? Uh, you, can, you can even declare an alternate administrative theme hook, and you declare what, um, what its regions are. What are those variables going to be that you are, are sending in? And that's it. Uh, but that, that is a good amount. And it's something we have inconsistently implemented in, in Drupal core. When you define a render element in Drupal core, you say what JavaScript or CSS it relies on. But not when you declare a theme hook. When you declare a theme hook, you might say, all I need is an element because I know the preprocess layer is going to dig into that element variable and figure out what it actually needs. Or you can do what, say, theme item list does and say I expect a title and I expect a list of items. Uh, the inconsistency is making it a lot harder. If we can standardize around defining what do we depend on, what can we do, we'll be able to work with web components more easily because web components are defining these concepts as well. Web components are coming up with new ways of saying, I'm a web component and I expect to be given a title, an image, a subtitle, and a date. That's what I expect and I'll, I'll do what I want with them. You don't need to know what I'm doing with them, but give me those things. Uh, and panels is already a, a similar mental model that we can use as a, as a reference. So to quote myself, as the Drupal community asks itself again, how we want to do rendering, let's also ask how we want to think about rendering. Uh, this is a core conversation, so I, I'm hoping to, to get a good conversation going here. Uh, feel free to, to walk up to the mic and uh, give whatever thoughts you have, but I, I've got, a specific, I've got a, some specific questions that I think can generate conversation as well. Can we separate the thing that prints data at all from the thing that says how it gets printed? When you use panels now, there's still the core theme system saying, print me a node. And I'm going to assume that the preprocess system will make that work sensibly. And that's where panels hooks in. Uh, it hooks in and says, oh, you're printing an article. It's a, it's a teaser. So I know that means this exact panels configuration. And then it does, uh, then it does what it does. Can, is that separation a good thing? Uh, I think for at least the immediate future in Drupal, we're going to need to keep that part the part where core can say nothing more than print me a node, please, and we'll need a separate system to handle it that sensibly. I don't know if that's a good thing, but I think for the immediate future, we, we probably need it. Is sharing markup outside of Drupal something we even want to do? I like the idea of being able to share our responsive toolbar with the rest of the world, but maybe that's not a responsibility we want. Um, I'd love to hear opinions on that. Uh, does someone need to write a web component theme? Um, the theme layer is a place we could hook in. We could conceivably replace the theme functions for item list or the theme function for that administrative toolbar with something that just calls uh, a web component. 
how many invented here parts of Drupal can we strip out and still have it be Drupal? Can we lose the markup, some of our markup that we wrote, and still be Drupal? What patterns do you see Drupal implementing now? Uh, we've got a complex render pipeline, but how do you think about it? Which parts do you think are most impor important? The parts that let you think of it as MVC, the parts that let you think of it as uh, action domain responder, the parts that let you think of it as model view presenter, and what pattern do you want Drupal to use? Maybe there's a pattern that really doesn't make sense at all for the tooling we have, but is a pattern that we should use. And what parts of the D8 render pipeline do you expect to think about most? So this is a question uh, that, I, that I sort of asked in Wim's presentation. We've got these events where we can override a response, um, but is that something I'm going to think about as a site builder? In Drupal 7, I know that page manager completely depends on hook menu alter. But in building a Drupal 7 site, I don't have to think about that very often. Uh, what parts do you think we're going to be using all the time without thinking about it? What parts are we going to be using all the time and still have to think about it all the time? If you're using the pre-process layer, you're probably thinking about it all while you're using it. All right, that's my list of questions. Uh, I'd, love, I'd love to hear your questions as well. Thank you. Anyone at all? <laughs> yeah, if you can use the mic, please do so. So in my company, um, we 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 um, we have one site where we use Drupal, and so I'm, or I'm a user, not an agency or something like that. We have one major site where we use Drupal extensively, Drupal seven, and and another site which is actually built with. Um, with a single page, you know, SPA approach at the front end, mm -hmm. all the user interface is in there, and then the back end is actually ASP.NET. Okay. So at this conference, I've been going to the headless Drupal sessions, you know, mm -hmm. and, and thinking about, oh, you know, if we could get Drupal to, you know, to satisfy the the um, you know, provide market for the ASP.NET, and uh, obviously you can, and you can do it by creating a, a RESTful API. In Drupal, what I wish for is, is uh, best I can articulate this, is first of all a. I'd like to I'd like to go further down the render pipeline, and get some, you know not all the way back to pure data, mm -hmm. and um, and and get something that that we could still consume, in a richer client. Sure. You see what I'm getting at? I I do. Uh so I'm, this is just a, a desire. I, I'm sure. Not, I don't actually have a great solution. So I, I think the question you're asking is, is one um, that I've asked as well, which is if you want headless Drupal, where is Drupal's neck? Where do you cut off the head? <laughs> do you cut off Drupal's head before theme? Do you cut off, cut off Drupal's head right before the template file after all the pre-processing is done? And maybe you've gotten more of that. Um, some people have call it, called it hydrated content as, as people have, have started to use Drupal 8 and they see what um, the REST module exposes. They see, okay, yes, this is the raw data, but I didn't want the image file ID. I wanted uh, its path I wanted the large version, I wanted the medium version. Um, so w where do you cut off Drupal's head? And th there are a bunch of different answers. I, I strongly recommend for your, for your use case going to the presentation on weather.com this afternoon because th they've taken an interesting approach, which is to use panels on the Drupal side for assembling a bunch of components and panels exposes the data to Angular components. So the template files are Angular. What we looked at here was template files being PHP template files that Drupal renders on the server side. Um, 
weather.com has, has answered the question of we're cutting off Drupal's head right in this point of panels and I guess conceivably they could still render uh, those Angular files server side somehow, but they're rendering them client side instead. Larry. Hello. So to answer a couple of the questions you asked, because you had a lot of questions. Yes. Um, <clears throat> on the server side, one thing I've been starting to say recently is long-term, like Drupal 9 vision, Drupal consists of nothing but a vendor directory, so third-party components, even if we wrote them, and forms. And just architecturally, that level of separation is where we want to go. And it makes sense to me to do the same thing on the client side to the extent that the technology enables it. Um, the challenge there, and I mean, the core of Drupal is not the tool, the core of Drupal is content management and a content management platform that's extensible for non-engineers to be able to do something with. Mm -hmm. But the challenge with that, with that level of really good decoupling on server side or client side or in the middle, mm -hmm. as it is sometimes the case, is understanding all of those moving pieces that you have nice and cleanly separated gets progressively more challenging. Um, people have a very hard time understanding decoupled components. That is a professional level concept. And so the big challenge I see for us is you know, we could technologically build a system that is all REST based and lots of freestanding components on the server side and completely web components on the client side and you know, lots of flexibility and everything's third party and swappable. Mm -hmm. And now how do people who are not attending their fourth DrupalCon actually understand what they're doing? Mm -hmm. Because, or how do we, how do we take the complexity of a modern car engine and reduce it to a steering wheel you turn left and right that still gets good gas mileage? That's a really, really hard problem. And, you know, making web components accessible to themers who don't understand web components is that's a really hard problem that we're going to have to try and address. I don't have an answer for that. Sure. Uh, so I'll, I'll try to answer your question, I think, in reverse. First, I don't think we need to commit 100% to web components. So I, I don't think we should necessarily uh, ask someone building a site in Drupal to understand web components. I would like, a, I would like to see us adopt an architecture that would make it possible to say, no, I'm not going to render that server side. I'm going to use a web component. So uh, I could see a, a web component theme, a web component based theme as, as a possibility there where you pick and choose which parts of Drupal you want to replace and that's an advanced usage, at least in the near term. It's possible that in five years web components will be so dominant that just of course, uh, just as we use HTML5 elements now, of course we would use web components, but we're, we're certainly not there yet. Uh, I, I think your deeper question though about um, how do we ad address the needs of, of someone who may not understand this architecture, uh, for better and worse, almost nobody understands the architecture we have now. So if, if, the, bar that we, if the bar that we need to clear is keeping it as understandable or more understandable than what we have now, at least that's a low bar to clear. <laughs> Touche. Which is, which is both a good thing and a bad thing. Uh, the, the bar that we have now made it possible to satisfy the 80% use case really easily in 2006, 2007, where the 80% use case may have been a simpler design system, where the use case we wanted to satisfy was the ability to point and click um, together really quickly. And I, I think that use case is still there, the use case of wanting to be able to point and click something usable quickly, that's still there. Uh, but I, thi I think as web components and modern front end tools become more and more common, the wider Drupal world or the wider web world who hasn't been to four Drupal cons will just assume well, of course, I can point and click together things that involve Angular or things that involve web components. Uh, the architecture we have now was, was designed, I think, to match the expectations of the mid-2000s. 
expectations have shifted radically, and I don't think we're meeting them very well. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, to say that Drupal's architecture is difficult to understand is uh, definitely an understatement. Uh, <laughs> so those are really great questions. I, I don't think this compares with that, but I, I think the first thing that anybody who is not a themer and, and isn't even like going to even try to wrap their heads around the architecture and figure out you know, which way should I go or whatever, I think the first thing a point and clicker who's trying to build a website without actually getting into any code is the first question they're going to ask is, well, if I'm going to use web components, if I actually even understand web components correctly, would I possibly be introducing any other issues like security issues maybe? Mm -hmm. Like, because now it's not all kind of Drupalized. It's not a module that I'm installing in Drupal that is somehow vetted by the community or at least is in moderated in any sense. Is that, or do I not actually understand web components? I, I think your I think your base assumption is correct that by moving things that we would traditionally do server side into the client side, absolutely, there's an increased possibility of exposing something you don't want to expose. Um, exposing data that you wouldn't even realize that you're exposing. For instance, um, if, if, if you cut off Drupal's head at the raw node object, then it's possible that you'd be sending unescaped text uh, over the wire. And, and now if, if you're theming your node, you're, you're not going to send the raw field value. You're going to send the one that's passed through TPLs and, and gotten escaped. So absolutely, yes, I think your, your base concern is correct that by moving more and more things server side, by definition, we're moving processes that we could just assume would be secure because they were happening on our server. Well, now we need to think about it more. Um, in general, though, my hope, my expectation is that by adopting web components, we'd be getting even more eyes on, on our tooling. I th I'd be concerned if we were writing our own web components that were completely coupled to our architecture. We, I don't think we would get any benefit from that whatsoever right now if we, um, if we replaced theme node with a web component for node that was still completely coupled to internal implementation internal implementation details about nodes and entity API that I don't, I don't see what benefit we, we would get. But if we could take a web component that was written by a larger community, vetted by node developers, vetted by developers who are experts in JavaScript, then we, we don't have to become experts on everything. Um, so yes, we'd be introducing new risks, but we'd also be... Um, embracing a larger community that would help us negotiate those risks. Well, that sounds great. I mean, because the, the idea of it, the way you described it, definitely sounds really, really great. Because having worked on a fairly complex installation of Drupal, I can tell you that if, if, I, if, if it did exist, boy, I'd be one of the first adopters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, great. Any other questions? Anyone with? An answer to, uh, to one of the questions I asked. <laughs> Larry. So to respond a bit to uh, your previous answer, <clears throat> a web component consists of effectively a template, some CSS, and some JavaScript, mm -hmm. and some input variables. A theme hook in Drupal now consists of a template, the input variables, and it would not be that hard to let the theme hook declare some CSS and JavaScript that go with it. Right. So it sounds like with one patch, we could make a theme hook be a web component. Yeah. Why shouldn't we? Bra uh, limited browser support for the moment aside, why shouldn't we? Because the first thing we should do is see if it works in contrib, as has been our answer for most things. I, I think one of the first steps would be someone writing a, a web component based theme that replaced some number of theme hooks with web components. Not replacing the theme hook, but replacing the thing that happens in the theme hook. So rather than 
sending the administrative toolbar um, theme hook to the administrative toolbar a twig file it would get sent to a web component. Now, th I think that would be difficult. <laughs> uh, I, I would probably pick an easier theme hook to start with, but one that's still worth doing. Um, you know, moving an item list into a web component, I, I don't know what benefit we would get from that because UL is a pretty stable HTML element I don't know what benefit we would get from making that into a web component. Um, but there probably is a, a middle ground theme hook out there where it's interesting enough to make it worthwhile. Okay. Since no one else is here. Uh, <laughs> um, one of the things that you talked about with panels that I think kind of gets glossed over is you've got the incoming data which node or user or taxonomy term or whatever, and you have this template that just understands strings, mm -hmm. and then you have this user configuration in the middle that marshals from one to the other. Yes. That object in the middle is actually where all of the hard parts are. Yes. So how do we make that less ugly and easier to understand? You know, that, that's the important glue piece. Mm -hmm. So what do we need to do there to make it more understandable, more web component friendly? You know, what can we learn there or what can we what do we need to learn there in that glued piece? Mm -hmm. I think we need to look at what other systems do. Um, how do other systems make the presentation, the presenter layer in MVP, or the view model in model view, view model? Uh, how do those work? Um, within the Drupal ecosystem, I'm really interested in Amitai's RESTful module, which takes a different approach from um, core's rest module. Core's rest module by default exposes nearly every property on an entity and it exposes it with its internal name. So field subtitle would be exposed as field underscore subtitle. Amitai's module in Drupal 7 assumes whitelisting only. It assumes that there's going to be a class that gets a node object sent into it and then that class is going to determine I want to expose uh, only title, only field subtitle, and I'm going to expose it as subtitle instead of field subtitle. Um, so that's a model module that right now doesn't have a UI, but I think it's a, um, a simpler implementation of the task of taking a raw node object and getting it ready for some other consumption where in the RESTful modules case it's consumption by some API consumer. Here, we're targeting for a consumer that's a template, but it's conceivable that we could use the same tooling. Okay, thanks. Um, so, uh, one thing I, I recently had to do, and I don't know if it's, it's the right approach, um, is uh, I had the, the theme radios, uh, you know, theme function mm -hmm. and uh, what it does is it takes, you know, uh, an array of options and uh, it adds a bunch of, uh, you know, children to the render array, right? Mm -hmm. And for each of them, it it adds a theme wrapper to, for, for you know, rendering the div tag uh, outside of each element. So what I did is I, I needed to get some HTML in there and, and in each of them, so I swapped the theme wrapper, mm -hmm. right? And that's something that that's great about Drupal. That you need something very custom and, and you kind of do that thing. Mm -hmm. How would that work with web components? Would it be like a web component that takes only the initial array and nothing else? Yeah, I, I think what you're talking about is a, a trade-off that we have to face between the power that the Drupal 7 module development book highlighted where nearly every single HTML element is coming from a separate theme function and every single one can be overridden. That is incredibly powerful, and we shouldn't throw it away lightly because you're describing the use case that, that benefits from it, where you can do something extremely surgical and change only the part you want to change and not have to um, reinvent the wheel. Right. On the other side, one of the reasons I like um, panels is because it makes it easier for me to open a layout plugin and understand all the markup that I need to understand that design component. So um, 
One, one example I use there is placing a node title in a panel's layout. The, the title pane UI gives you a select list for do you want this to be an H1, do you want this to be an H2, and you can very easily make the H1 or H2 come from the UI. I use the option no wrapper because I want that H2 or H1 coming from the template file. I want to be able to open up one template file and understand everything I need to understand markup wise for this design component, for this node teaser or whatever it is. Uh, the, the scenario you're describing is, is one that's really powerful, really beneficial, but takes so much training and experience to understand. And, and I think we, we would benefit from um, moving that needle from granularity to comprehensibility. So, again, we're like end users of Drupal. Although this is my fourth DrupalCon, and <laughs> I do have a computer science degree from MIT. <laughs> so hopefully I can understand these things. But, but I don't have that much time to do it. Right. right. So we have another site that we're beginning to work on. It's really going to be a micro site, and it's kind of a low stakes thing. And we need a theme for it. So before we you know, commissioned the design of a theme, I thought, well, let's go out and shop for, you know, the off-the-shelf themes, right? Mm -hmm. Well, you can go out and there's free ones and there's paid ones and they're really pretty inexpensive. But all of the new ones have an awful lot of, they usually have some JavaScript framework in them, you know, Bootstrap or, or sometimes Angular or something. And the ni all the nicer themes are doing this now. And I guess some people are, like, paying 50 bucks and... You know, buying these things, usually they get installed with a distribution, so mm -hmm. everything kind of works right away. But whatever they're doing, to me, is a little opaque right now. I mean, I hesitate to use them because I think, what are they, you know, how is this organized and how, mu how much time will I have to spend going into the code? Mm -hmm. So that's just an observation about what's happening, you know, in the, out in the, out in the wild you know, with, with paid themes. Yeah, and, and I think it, it highlights an unresolved question in the Drupal community of where are you supposed to do something? Um, th those themes come with uh, distributions. How easy, it for, how easy is it for you as the person downloading a half dozen of those to understand what's happening where? And I, I think the goal of, of a lot of those projects is to say, you, you don't have to understand. It just works. And that works if it works. <laughs> if it doesn't work, you are stuck trying to debug magic. And I don't know how to debug magic. I know how to debug systems that I can understand. And it's... I, I don't want to discourage people from... Um, trying to build things that simply work and do amazing things out of the box. There's absolute value in that. I don't need to know, uh, Larry and I were talking about this last night, I don't need to know how all of my iPhone works to use it. But I'm also not trying to debug my iPhone very often. As, as a Drupal site builder, uh, understanding how it works is more important to me than out of the box functionality in a lot of cases, which is why uh, I use Zen as my base theme because it doesn't do that much out of the box other than strip a lot of things out. It, it adds a little bit, um, but not that much, and I can understand how it works, and to me that's more valuable. Um, and to, to quote Larry again, we, need to, we as a Drupal community need to establish some prioritization system for those kinds of trade-offs because... There's a large community out there that wants something amazing as soon as they install it, and they don't want to know how it works. They don't care how it works. And there's a community that wants to install the minimal installation and only add pieces that they understand, and sometimes those are in opposition. All right, well, thank you, everyone.